Hello there everybody and welcome to the Mr. Sin channel. Today for Human Geography, we're gonna be learning about the five themes of geography. So take out your guided notes, you can find them in the description below. Remember, they go along with the video and it'll help you remember all the important things. Don't forget to subscribe and let's go figure out what the five themes of geography are. Now throughout our class, we're gonna go into a lot of different things. So in order for you to remember the five themes of geography, I want you to remember Mr. HELP. Mr. HELP is an acronym that'll help you with remembering the five themes of geography. The first one, the M, is movement. Then the R, regions. The H and the E are human environment interaction. The L is location. And then lastly, we have place. If you can remember Mr. HELP, you can remember the five themes of geography. So let's break down each of these themes and see exactly what they are. Our first theme is movement, and it deals with a lot more than just physically moving around. It'll deal with transportation, communication, the diffusion of ideas and cultures and religions. Movement happens all the time. Now, the tricky thing with movement is this is not just you walking down the street. For human geography, movement is when we're going from one place to another and you're impacting it, you're changing it. So think about it this way. For example, right now the internet is changing how we move throughout society. We can transfer information very fast now. For example, right now you're learning from me, I'm from Minnesota and I don't even know where you are from, but you are getting information from one place and now it's impacting you in a different place. Other things to think about as examples would be if you live in a city with a lot of tourists. Those tourists help boost your economy. People come, they travel to your city, they interact, they buy things, they support the economy, create more jobs, they're impacting there. And maybe they have a great experience. So for example, Rochester, Minnesota has Mayo Clinic. People come all over the world to come to Rochester. They have a great experience at Mayo, they go home, they tell their friends, their family about Mayo, more people come, and there's this back and forth. Movement happens all the time, and it's happening even more with the advancements in technology. But it's important because this is how we diffuse things. This is how we spread ideas. This is also not even just ideas, but goods and services. When we're selling things, when we are trading, all these different things are examples of movement. Now our next theme of geography is regions, and regions can be broken into three categories. We have formal regions, functional regions, and we also have perceptual regions. We're gonna start with formal regions, and then we'll get to the other two. Formal regions are regions that have kind of set boundaries. It's very well established. Inside these boundaries are areas that have a lot of similarities. It might be geography, it could be culture, it could be language, it could be religion, maybe politics, or even economics. Examples of this would be a country. Countries are examples of formal regions. Now that's not just the only thing that could be a formal region. We could go off geography. For example, we could look at the Corn Belt for the United States. You could look at mountain ranges. We could look at Chinatown in San Francisco or Chicago, an area in the city that has very similar characteristics. A lot of Chinese Americans live there. We have a lot of restaurants that are owned by Chinese Americans. We also have stores as well. This area functions kind of as its own formal region. We could also look at linguistic regions like in Canada with the French speaking formal regions. So there's a bunch of different examples of formal regions. They're all over the place. Now our next type of region is functional. And this is a little bit different than our formal region. The main focus here is a functional region has a center point. It has a central hub, a node, something that is the epicenter of the surrounding area. And it's connected by movement. That central hub is the focal point that helps support the surrounding areas. Without the central hub, the surrounding areas probably wouldn't even be in this region. And so it's important. It could be a distribution center, it could be a major city, it could even be a river that is supplying water to support the local community. All these different things, functional regions, are connected by movement. Remember, this is the transportation of goods and communication, diffusion of ideas, political systems, all this different stuff. So they'll still have similar characteristics, but the big focus here is there is a central point. One example of this is Dallas-Fort Worth metropolitan area. This area is connected by an airport that holds the two cities together, and that's where trade happens and also the communication and tourism and all these different things come from this one focal point. 
So that's the big thing with functional regions to remember is that there is a focal point that supports the surrounding areas. Without it, those areas probably wouldn't exist where they are today. Now our last type of region is perceptual regions. Now these are a little bit harder to just define because there is no perfect definition. Perceptual regions are regions that exist because of people's beliefs, attitudes, their feelings, all these different things create perceptual regions. So a perceptual region will change depending on who you're talking to. I'll give some examples so it makes a little bit more sense, but the Middle East is a perfect example. What countries are in the Middle East? Think about it. If you talk to your friend or someone else, they'll probably say some countries that are not, according to you at least, in the Middle East. Or maybe you have countries that they don't consider part of the Middle East. The Middle East, we all know what it means, but what exactly is the Middle East? Same thing with like the Midwest for the United States. What states are in the Midwest? Even the perception of is the Midwest really boring and there's no opportunities is a perceptual region. They are perceiving that the Midwest has no opportunities and it's a boring place to be and that defines this region, yet someone else you could talk to will have a very different perception. Perceptual regions are hard to define because it's impossible to just empirically prove it. And they can also kind of conflict with some of the other regions because this is what people believe. So depending on who you're talking to and what you're talking about, a perceptual region may change. So these are the three different types of regions. Hopefully they make a little bit more sense now. Our next theme of the five themes of geography is human environment interaction. Now this one we're gonna see continue to pop up throughout our course, especially when we get into environmental determinism. But human environment interaction looks at some simple questions. What is the relationship between humans and their environment? How have humans changed the environment? How do humans utilize their resources? What is the human impact on our environment? What's going on there? Now, it's important to note that this is a relationship. It's a back and forth. Humans will continuously manipulate the environment that they live in to be able to better create lives for themselves and to just survive. And the environment will also have a reaction to our manipulation. One example of this is at Rochester, Minnesota, we have Goose Poop Lake or Silver Lake. It was created to help cool down a power plant. Well, that provided an open body of water and in the winter it doesn't freeze over due to the power plant kind of heating the water. And so a bunch of geese migrate down and now there's goose poop everywhere. But that is an example. We changed the environment, we created an open body of water, we provided a habitat, and now the environment responded with having more animals come. In response, the city has tried to get rid of some of them to clean up the area, and it's this back and forth relationship. But that's human environment interaction, this back and forth between us and the environment. Our next theme of geography is location. Now location can be broken up into two categories. We have absolute location and relative location. Absolute location, just think of your smartphone when you have to type in someone's address. It's gonna be using longitude, latitude, you're gonna have precise points. Absolute location never changes. Most of the time we're using longitude and latitude here and we'll use a grid system. We can pinpoint a spot. It doesn't matter what happens there, that spot will always be the same on Earth. It's absolute, it does not change. Relative location is our next type of location. And unlike absolute location, relative location uses a place's position in relation to other places around it. So it can change. Relative location, we will use a lot, especially if you're trying to give directions to your friend or someone you know, and you're explaining the surrounding area. Oh yeah, take the road, you'll see a Taco Bell, then take a right, then you'll see Chipotle, and I'm on the northern part of the parking lot. All those things are relative depending on your perspective. Even going right or left depends on which way you're looking or driving on the road. The north part, well what part of the north? Are you northeast, northwest? What exact area? Even when you're talking about the store locations, those could change over time. You're using your surrounding area to describe a location. However, they can change. For example, Rochester, Minnesota is around 80 miles away from St. Paul. But what part of St. Paul? Exactly which way 80 miles? It's all relative, depending on your perspective and where you are. So that's the difference between relative location and absolute. Absolute, it's always the exact same. Longitude, latitude, that grid system. And relative, you're using your surrounding area to describe a location. Our last theme of geography is place. And we can break it into physical characteristics and human characteristics. Physical characteristics are as simple as what does the area look like? Is there mountains? Is it flat? Is there a prairie? Do we have bluffs? 
Is there a river or ocean next to it? Is it a tropical area? Is it a tundra? What's going on? It can also be described with weather patterns. Is it normally rainy or sunny? Is it always cloudy? Does that place experience tornadoes and hurricanes and big events? All of these would be examples of physical characteristics that would make a place unique. We can use these to describe a certain place and location. The next one is human characteristics. Now, these are as simple as how many people are living there? What languages are spoken? How many people are unemployed or employed? What's the political system, the economic system there? Is there a religion? What languages are spoken? All of these are human characteristics. A lot of times, think about it this way. When we come back from a trip and we visited some area, people ask how it is. You will describe human characteristics and physical characteristics of that place. Normally, you focus on the things that were different and unique. Oh, those people were crazy. They all wore crazy shirts with these hats and they were all pink and purple. Or this place was beautiful. There was mountain ranges everywhere. There was an river that flew through it, it was awesome. And at the same time too, you might highlight the things that were similar. Oh, I was really surprised everyone spoke pretty good English. Or everyone actually had hamburgers, and I love hamburgers. I don't know why, but yes, hamburgers. These would be examples of place, human and physical characteristics to describe an area. You just learned the five themes of geography. Remember, if you're having a hard time remembering all of them, remember Mr. Help, movement, regions, human environment interaction, location, and place. Hopefully that'll help you remember the five themes. Make sure you can also give examples for each of the themes so you have a good understanding of what they are. Now, thank you for watching the video. Make sure you subscribe so you can get notifications of new videos. And why not? It's free. Until next time, I'm Mr. Sin. Thank you for joining me today, and I will see you next time.